You, finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape with us now to England and the story of an innocent man caught up in a murderous web of international intrigue as Jeffrey Household tells it in his exciting new novel, A Rough Shoot. It had happened on an autumn evening so silent and peaceful that no one could have a thought of human violence. And now I was walking home from Mr. Blossom's farm in Dorset, on which I had rented the hunting rights, the rough shooting for the season. As I approached our house where my wife and children were waiting supper, I took a last anxious look back over my shoulder across the meadow dotted with clumps of thorn, gorse and bramble stretching away until it vanished in a mist of gray and green. And then I hurried on into the house, glad for its cozy warmth and feeling of security. Oh, what kept you so long, Roger? I'm sorry, Cecily. Where, where are the boys? They had their supper. I've sent them to bed. You must be starved. I'm afraid I'm, I'm not hungry. What I need is a pot of whiskey. Roger, what's the matter? I don't quite know how to tell you, my dear. Tell me what? What is it? Well, out, out, out there on the chute. Just, just a little while ago. Roger, what happened? Oh, Cecily, I, 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 can, I can hardly believe it myself now. Well, tell me what happened. All right. I killed a man. What? It, it, it's true, Cecily. I, I, I killed a man, and then I threw his body in the sump. Roger! It, 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 it's true, Cecily. But, but you couldn't have... I don't believe it. Uh, uh, listen to me, Cecily. You see, I, I, I was walking back from Mr. Blossom's farm, and I saw three men bending over something by a hedge. Uh, I, I, I thought they might be poachers. So I, I darted towards them when a... A, a, a cock pheasant suddenly flew up in front of them, and then one of the men shot it with an air pistol. Yes. Well, well, it made me angry, and I, I lost my head. You see, if, if they were poachers, I wanted to teach them a lesson to frighten them. So I, I, I let one of them have a charge of bird shot in the seat of the pants, and then he, he fell forward onto the ground, and he lay there kicking for a moment, and then, then he, he was still. I, I ran up to him, I, I turned him open, and I found that he'd fallen onto a sharp spike that he'd been working with. Oh, Roger, how terrible. It was driven into his head. It killed him. Oh, then you didn't... He, it was an accident. Yes, I know it was, but no one will believe it now. But why, Roger? Because I've hidden his body under ten feet of water in the sump. Why did you do that? I don't know why, Cecily. I don't know why I did it. I just lost my head, that's all. Oh. Roger, you said there were three men there. Yes. What became of the others? Well, that, that's the strangest thing of all, Cecily. When he fell, they turned and ran. But, but why? I don't know why. Oh. Have you told the police? I can't tell the police. Mr. Blossom will go to them. It happened on his farm. He'll go. No. Blossom doesn't know about it. But surely he'll find out. No one will find out. That is, not until the body is discovered. What about his friends, the men who saw it? Well, certainly, is if those two men were going to the police, they'd have stayed to identify me. But they ran away instead. Don't you see, for some reason, they didn't want me to identify them. Well, if they were... Poachers? Oh, no, no, no. They weren't poachers. I'm sure of that. Oh, then what were they doing there? I don't know, my dear, but... 
For my own protection, I'd better find out. How? Well, the only thing I can do is to go back there and see what I can discover. Oh, won't that be rather dangerous? Well, it would be more dangerous not to find out. Yes. Yes, perhaps it would. Oh, but do be careful, Roger. Yes, of course, my dear. Of course I shall. I went to a garage in town. I rented a bicycle and I pedaled out to the back acres of Mr. Blossom's farm. Out to where only a couple of hours ago I had killed a man. It was a gusty night. The trees along the road were enveloped in mist and creaked and whispered in the wind. I came to the great hedgerow of thorn and holly, the rattle of whose branches and dying leaves made enough noise to cover the sound of my approach. And there I stopped and looked about, into the milky and uneasy world that surrounded me. And suddenly, parked on the road ahead, I saw a motorcycle and sidecar. I left my bicycle. I crept down the road, parked the motorcycle, staying close to the hedgerow. You've got to the chopper. I don't like it. He saw it. He's bound to come back. Shut up and get to it. I never go complaining. Oh, but I... What's that? I don't hear anything. There's something here in his head. Give me that flashlight. Turn off that Here he is. All right, you come up to bed. That's a mess of... You... You come back here. Come back and see. I raced back down the road, still gripping the shovel I'd snatched from the man who had attacked me. And when I reached their motorcycle, I stopped just long enough to slash the exposed, delicate wiring of its engine with a shovel and then ran on. A few minutes later, I was pedaling furiously home. <laughs> Next morning, after seeing Cecily and the boys off to church in the village, I decided to go straight to Mr. Blossom's farm, avoiding for the present an investigation of the scene at the hedgerow. I thought it best to see if I could discover anything from Blossom before exposing myself further. As I approached the farmhouse, I, I noticed a big shiny limousine parked out by the barn and Mr. Blossom in the yard talking to his landlord, Robert Hayne Hassingham. I would have preferred avoiding Hassingham on that particular morning, but... They had already seen me, and so I well, walked you know, on and into the I've yard. I've seen everyone about these premises who's new around here, yes, and I course, just... Of course, Mr. Blossom, I was just wondering. Government, you know, very strict about poachers. Ah, good morning, Colonel Payne. Good morning, Hassan. Mr. Blossom. Good morning, sir. Well, I've just been protecting your hunting rights. Up. Uh, what do you mean, protecting them? Some poachers about. How do you know that? I... One of the men, the man who saw them, he, he came to me. Well, now, he shouldn't be bothering you with that. I don't understand why a man who saw someone poaching on my hunting preserve wouldn't come to me. Well, perhaps he tried. Perhaps he couldn't find you. Who was he? Well, I haven't any idea. I never saw him before in my life, Colonel Tane. Mr. Tane, if you don't mind. Or just Tane. I'm not fussy, but not Colonel. I'm only a military man in case of war. Your military heritage is something you can't ever cast aside, Tame. If you're trying to recruit me for your People's Union organization, you might just as well forget it. Many of your fellow officers are in it, Tame. I doubt if there are very many. All right, all right. A few. But we don't want everyone. I don't like your outfit, Hasingham. It's too exclusive for my taste. Discriminating is the word. Fanatical is a better one. And perhaps fascistic is the best of all. We are not a political organization. Well, I still don't like it. You'll come around, Tane. You'll have to come around. I'll have to? You're not talking to one of your hirelings, Hassingham. General Hassingham, we must get back to town before Tim. Yes, yes, in, in a moment, hire. <laughs> of course, Tane, we shouldn't argue. Men like ourselves, whose basic interests are so close. Are they? Uh, Colonel Tane, this is Mr. Hyatt. Mr. Hyatt? Why, well, yes. Nothing unusual about that? Oh, it was the mister I wondered about. How so? Are you an executive in the People's Union? Yes. Why? 
I thought all executives were officers in your organization. Yeah, but I am a kind of officer, Mr. Team. Mm -hmm. What kind? Security. Uh, intelligence work? In a way. Mm. A sort of super policeman? Sort of. <laughs> you see, Tain, we have men of varied abilities in our organization. I think uh, we'll be late for the meeting. Uh, yes, yes, of course. You're right. Oh, by the way, Mr. Tain... Do you ever go shooting in the early evening? What? I... Oh, I know. Of course not. That's odd. Why? Why should it be odd that I don't shoot in the early evening? Last evening, someone was shooting on your game preserve. Well, what of it? It happens all the time. What are you trying to imply, Hyatt? Why, nothing, sir, but it seems curious that a man who loves to shoot wouldn't be interested in who poached on his own grounds. Good day, sir. As I walked back across Blossom's farm, across the great expanses of close rabbit turf dotted with dense thickets of bramble, it seemed more and more clear that Hassingham's and Hyatt's question of me about the previous night's shooting meant only one thing. They were somehow involved with the man I had killed. And then it suddenly occurred to me that theirs was not a personal interest but that the People's Union was mixed up in all this. I wished more than ever that I had gone to the police immediately. Ahead of me, a hare suddenly dashed out of a thicket and scampered away across the warren. Stay where you are. What? You are a foolish man, Mr. Tame. What do you want? You are an amateur. I've intrigued, Mr. Tame. You are no competition for Hassingham. Are you a friend of Hassingham? He would like me to be. Or rather, once he would have liked me to be. Hyatt? Hyatt needs no one. He is evil unto himself. You, you are German. I was German. And you mean you're a Nazi? Ah, the loyal Englishman who never forgets a war. Perhaps. I can. You are a bungler. Your English bungling delayed my plans. How stupid to shoot at von Cleek. Von Cleek? Yes. You bungled into killing a man you don't even know. That is terrible luck, my friend. I am not your friend. Nor are you my enemy. Do you know why? Because I don't care about you. I don't care whether you live or die. After we have served each other's purposes. Arthur. Who are you? Mordell. General Mordell. A general without an army. The most useless of all useless things. Mordell? I will refresh your memory. I was part of the Nazi general staff. There was a point in the war where some of us, some generals who had put Hitler into power, decided his leadership was no longer useful. He could have led us to victory, but he was leading us to defeat. Worse, to total destruction. Oh, yes, yes, Mordell. The Nazi general star. Correct. Yes, they said you were dead. They said all of us who failed to kill Hitler were dead. And it was true, except for one. For this one, for me. I want nothing to do with you. Listen, my dear fellow. Three former friends killed my family after I failed in the bomb plot. Three good staff officers. Since then, I've had but one mission in life. To kill them. I waited. Two are gone. The last one was due to land here on a plane until... Due on a plane? In this field? There's a strip a plane can land on about 100 yards west of us. When Cleek was helping to install one of the radio beacons they'll use to guide the plane in. When you shot him and upset everything. Now I want your help. It's ridiculous. When you shot Von Cleek and threw his body in the sump, you committed yourself to helping me. I'll have nothing to do with you or your plan. A murderer never has a choice. It was an accident. Which has become a murder. How do you know that I won't kill you? Because you need me. No matter how vehemently you protest the association. Because I can help you. And what could you possibly do to help me? I can get evidence against Hassingham and Hyatt, which can destroy them. On what basis? The People's Union. The People's Union? That's a farce. No one cares about it. No. It is more powerful than you think. Exposing it can set you free. The courier who will arrive on the plane in this field, he will carry a portfolio. And what will be in the portfolio? Nation you might use to convict these men of sedition. Sedition? Are you implying a fascist coup? Why, that's ridiculous in these days. Precisely why it is possible. 
And assuming what you say to be true... It is true. Assuming that I believe that. Assuming the people of the Union think I stumbled onto something last night and may either testify against me or kill me. They will, unless you help me. What must I do? Kill the courier? No, I will do that. You will merely be my accomplice. We will return to Escape and today's story, A Rough Shoot, in just a moment. Edmund O'Brien stars as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, radio's most expensive, exciting insurance sleuth. Johnny Dollar writes up the fanciest expense accounts, and while he's doing it, he takes his listeners along on thrilling, unusual insurance investigations of arson, robbery, and murder. Every Wednesday night, listen in over CBS Radio as Johnny Dollar totes up his swindle sheet while he treats you to action and mystery galore. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, will be in action later tonight on most of these same stations. And now, back to Escape. <laughs> Nothing to eat for me, Stephanie. All right. Ah, such an understanding wife you have, Payne. Never forces her husband to do anything he does not want to do. No. I had a wife once, and children. They killed my family because they couldn't find me. Nothing moves you, does it? Nothing, no compassion for the outcast. You created your own monster and it destroyed you. No one made you do it. Exactly. No one. You are right. I do not seek pity, nor do I give it. The German general staff created Hitler, and part of the staff eventually changed its mind. Yeah, falling out of thieves. Roger. Don't worry, Mrs. Payne. Your husband and I cannot have a falling out. We are not bound together by loyalty. We have more powerful motivations. I, revenge. Your husband, fear. Fear and revenge. All your life. Fear and revenge. Don't you think your good Hassingham and Hyatt function the same way? Hassingham's a fool who'll come to his senses soon. Never. You don't understand the British mind, do you? I understand the fascist mind. It's getting dark. Shall we go to the field? Roger? Mm, that's all right, my dear. What a shame it would be if we were to fail and Hassingham were to succeed. Your wife and children would be left alone. You're a cruel man. A vengeful man, as the courier will discover when he lands. Now, don't worry, my dear. It will be all right. Ah, the ex-soldier speaks in all his bravery. <laughs> Come, Tain. <laughs> As we had for the last three nights, we approached the landing strip from the woods. The whole affair seemed fantastic. For three nights, Mordell and I had hidden at the north end of the landing strip and waited for the plane to arrive. In spite of myself, I was going impatient. Wait. What is it? The men. They're waiting down the gully. Well, then the plane must be due tonight. Yes, it will be tonight. Come. We may not have much time. Well, perhaps we don't have time for anything. We must move the radio beacons. We can't move both of them. Those men are too close to the south beacon. But if we move the north beacon, just that one, it would bring the plane right to us. Well, if it comes in from the south, but if it comes in from the north, it will stop in front of us. We must take that chance. We were close enough to recognize Hyatt's voice. He was talking to the other men. We couldn't catch what they were saying, so we began to make our way slowly from thicket to thicket. Pausing, waiting breathlessly to see if we'd been detected. Finally, we came to the radio beacon. It was larger than a wireless set and would require both of us to carry it. We took it and, as quietly as possible, carried it to the far end of the field, near the woods, and set it up on its spiked legs. 
and we stepped back into the trees and waited. Mordell pulled something from his pocket. It won't be long now. What do you have there? An automatic pistol. English make. I prefer them. Didn't you bring one, Payne? No, of course not. Of course not? Why, of course oh, not? Oh, I, I, I don't know. I haven't carried one since... Since the, the war? <laughs> Certainly, you couldn't conceivably think of killing anyone except in a war. Then you really are going to kill that man on the plane? That has been obvious since our first conversation. You're determined to kill him? If he's the man I'm looking for? And I'm certain he is. The minute he steps off the plane? Oh, no. I'll wait. He must know it is I, Mordell, who is killing him. I must first remind him of many things. You must... Mordell. Yes? I'm going to turn myself into the police. By all means. I don't need you any longer. I... I can't... Well? Why don't you go? Afraid? I'll not have any part of this murder. Going to throw yourself on the mercy of the court. There huh? is still justice in the courts? Not if two such estimable gentlemen as Hyatt and Hassingham testify against you. You have enough. The plane is coming in, and it's coming in from the south. Now, now. Lower, lower. He's coming to our beacon. He must. Ah. Your last chance, Tain. Coming? Yes. Yes, I'm coming. You there. In the plane. Hurry. Don't stand there. Follow us. Who is it? And Greek, is it you? We can talk in the woods. Jump from the plane. Here we are. It's the police. Yeah. Hurry. Tell the pilot to go now. Can I see your face? Quickly! Hey, get that plane out of here, Elk. Fast! All right, for nurse. Into the woods. Yes, yes, I'm coming. Come back! Come back! Stop! Don't breathe! Hassan! You fool! Hassan! Be silent, Lux! Order! Silent! Quick! This way! I think he went into that thicket there. Over this way. Follow me now. Follow me. Hassingham and the others ran off in the wrong direction. With his gun, Mordell prodded the reluctant looks deeper into the woods and then stopped. It has been six years, looks. I... I did what was ordered. I tried to stop it, but everyone who was a friend of yours was suspect. Everyone. It had to be done. My good friend, Lux. My old comrade in arms, Lux. The murder of my family, Lux. Oh, I didn't really do it. Run, stop it. I was only there, Mortel. That's a lie. That's true. Don't understand. You had failed. And if we'd followed your example, if we'd turned on the floor also, there wouldn't have been anyone left to prepare. For what? For defeat? For destruction? What preparation was needed? No, 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 to prepare for afterwards. Here, look, look, in, in, in this briefcase, a list of names, men all over the world, still ready to help. Strong men, important men. Hey, here, Mordell, look, Mordell, in the briefcase. Step back, then. Throw it to me, Lux. Let me see it. Stay. I helped you. I upheld my part of the bargain. It was no bargain at all. You had no choice. Now, Lux, what was this about preparing for afterwards? Yes, yes, prepare. We, we have to protect the staff. Hitler himself meant nothing any longer. But we needed time to make plans to protect the staff. A lot your preparations did. That's why you're wrong, Mortel, wrong. We did well. You live in the past, the defeat. We are not defeated. Little by little we come back. Little by little we take over important work. Big work. An illusion, like the illusion we all had once. The illusion of the defeated. Are Colonel Hassingham and he aren't illusions? This is the same idiot song you sing. Oh, Mordell, don't you see? There is no past for us. No murdered wife, no murdered children, Lux. No past, all forgotten. This eh? had to be done. I, I, I had to go along with the others. You outdid the others. You, you can't. The, the past, it's over. We, we, we all did our duty. Still friend, good friend. You can't don't you do it. Don't yeah. try to don't interfere. Well, this is England. It's not Nazi Germany. Be silent! Lux! Mordell, you'll never get out of England alive. The police will... The argument is over. 
No, not a lot. For my oh. wife. Oh, dear. For my daughter, Luke. Oh, for oh, my oh. son, Luke. Oh. Right. You'll kill us. Follow me. Through here. Down the hollow. Here's Luke. Leave it, leave it. Come on. I, I am not meant to run. Give me the briefcase, then. No, no, no. I will go. There. Don't take time to fire back. I, I can hardly, hardly move. I can't. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, what else? I'm... I'm hit. I'm hit, Englishman. He dance for me. The briefcase. Give it to me. No. Let go of uh, the briefcase. Uh, there he is here somewhere. I know I hit one of them. Well, be careful. Ah, ah, here he is. But who? It's Mordell. Oh. Is he? I don't know. But find the briefcase. Go back to where we found luck. All right. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. I crept quietly to the edge of the woods and then ran as I had never run before. It was raining when I reached the village and as I walked through the deserted streets toward the familiar blue light that glowed over the entrance to the constabulary, I wondered if the police would believe the incredible story they were about to hear. And then, I remembered the briefcase under my arm, with its documents and its proof. Sergeant, my name is Roger Tain. Four nights ago, I shot a man. You'll find his body in the sump of Mr. Blossom's farm. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you a rough shoot by Jeffrey Hussold, specially adapted for radio by Arthur Ross and starring Ben Wright. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Stan Waxman, Mary Lansing, Howard McNear, Larry Dobkin, and Lou Krugman. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Escape with us to New Guinea and the story of a man who is to die at the hands of Papuan cannibals. The second his watch stops ticking. As Hugh Cave tells it in his unusual tale, The Silent Horror. The meanest crooks who deliberately trap teenagers into a life of crime. Those are targets for tomorrow night when Agent Shepard and the FBI in Peace and War tackle first offense specialists in a manhunt packed with action as well as human interest. Don't miss CBS Radio's startling FBI in Peace and War program tomorrow evening on most of these same stations for thrilling insight into rackets and racket smashing. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network.